are listening to the Bat Flip Podcast, a baseball podcast from Belly Up Sports and the Belly Up Podcast Network. Here are your hosts, Damian and Matt. Welcome back, everyone, to the Bat Flip Podcast. My name is Damian here with my co-host, Matt, coming to you on June 7th of 2022. Got a, uh, We're going to bring back the breakdown this week, but for the National League, last week we did the American League, uh, ran a little long, so we're pushing the National League this week. We have a couple manager firings. We have an extension to talk about, and then we'll get to players of the week at the end of the show. Uh, but before we get to all of that, how are you doing, Matt? Doing pretty good. Just uh, hanging out. Um, been a uh, been a pretty good week. Uh, watching a lot of baseball with uh, between the majors, and obviously always watching the majors, and then watching the college baseball tournament. It's been a lot of a lot of fun. But uh, but yeah, um, just uh, you know, ready to get ready to get into it. A long show today, so. Yeah, so let's go ahead and jump right in, and we'll start uh, with the Houston Astros signing Jordan Alvarez to a six-year, $115 million extension starting in 2023 that will run through 2028. Yeah, I think this is a great move on on both sides. Uh, If you are the Houston Astros, you just locked up a guy who has a career 160 WRC+. Uh, This season has been even crazier. A, uh, he's hitting 287, 385, 607 slugging with a 186 WRC plus this year so far, and 208 plate appearances. That includes 16 homers, and he's also cut his strikeout rate down to 16%, and his walk rate's up to 13%. He's doing this with a 269 batting average on balls in play, which is way under his expected numbers based on his stat cast data. So a lot of the projection systems think he could be even better than he's been so far this year. But um, this guy is insane as a, at the plate. Uh, he's a probably a you know a close to 40 home run hitter, maybe even more. Um, I don't know if he'll continue to strike out at as low a rate as he is right now. I think his strikeout rate will be a little bit higher. But um, you know this guy is a legitimate like super super good hitter. Top probably probably going to be a top five hitter in the league going forward. Um, so that get that out of the way, but uh, it's a good signing for for Houston because you lock him up. But it's also good for Alvarez because he does have some risk, and he's going to be able to cash in while he's really healthy and doing really well with it, with a pretty nice contract. Um, if, you know, the first things first, he's a DH, so his value is always going to be a little bit lower since he's not able to play the field. But um, you know, to go on top of that, even though he does play a tiny bit of left field, he, he can play out there. But you know, that kind of leads me to my next point. He's also had some injury history, especially with his knees. So you know, you're getting that money. You know, when any day you could have that 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 issue pop up again with your knees. So uh, very very happy that um, that Jordan Alvarez is um, is uh, is getting paid, and I'm sure the Astros are happy that he's going to be there long term. And this is kind of a good deal for both sides, in my opinion. Yeah, it buys out a couple of his free agent years. Um, so it's a good deal for Houston to get him for a couple extra years there. Jordan gets a massive bump. I believe this year he's making like six hundred or seven hundred and sixty four K. And I believe starting next year he gets at least five million and then it's like ten million and then it escalates up to fifteen. Um so he gets a, a you know a big pay jump for what he would get through renewable contracts and arbitration even, um, especially being a DH. So it's a really good deal for him. He's an amazing hitter, like you said. He's going to be, if not already, one of the top hitters in baseball. And he is a guy that can impact the game every single time he's up at the plate. Um, And just going back to how they acquired him, they got him for Josh Fields, like to the Dodgers. This guy was in the Dodgers organization, and they traded him for a relief pitcher who's not even in the majors anymore. So this is a fantastic all-around deal for Houston, how they got him and then signing him to this contract and the type of impact player that he has been. He's he's eerily familiar, similar to David Ortiz, in my opinion, as a player. I mean, I don't know if he's got the same off the field like charisma that David Ortiz had, but as a player, he's he's very very similar. Yeah, so it's gonna be fun to watch him. It will be fun to watch him for sure. Uh, so we're gonna jump over to our next com- or next part of it, and that's with the Angels relieving Joe Madden of his duties. Actually, today as we're recording this, um, after they have undergone a twelve game losing losing streak. Yeah, I mean, this was coming, I think, and I think it's good for the Angels um, because, you know, they have been they've been really struggling. And, um, you know, sometimes it's time to move on. And I never really especially liked the signing of Joe Madden to start with. I I think he's a guy who is just not that great of a, a 
you know, of a, of a manager in game. I think he does a good job with the clubhouse typically, but you know, it's kind of one of those things where you can, you can deal with him not being a great game day manager if you're winning because he keeps the clubhouse together and they're doing really well and everyone's happy. But when you struggle at the level that he struggled at uh, this year with the record and it doesn't look like the clubhouse is super happy with them. And that's really his only strength as a manager at the stage. So, um, it's, it's time. I mean, you know, there's a reason he was, the Cubs moved on from him, even though he won their first world series in a hundred years. Uh, he's very, very, very anti analytics, which is not going to jive with today's game, especially with the way you know, modern players are looking at things too. Um, I, I do give him some credit. I think he's done a fantastic job handling Shohei Otani and, and how that he's been used. And I think it'll be a pattern going forward. But other than that, um, you know, I, I really think it was beyond time for the Angels to move on from him. I, I don't. I'm not really a big believer in, in him as a manager. So, yeah, he was a great manager at one time, and there was probably the best manager in baseball at a certain time with the Tampa Bay Rays. But uh, I saw somebody to say, say this today. He was the best manager because he was quirky and he was different. Well, over time, not quirky wears on people, and it becomes really old really fast. And I feel like that's the transition we've seen. Like his style is just not what today's game needs. It, it worked at the time, but you have to evolve and he hasn't. Um, and then even in a, you know, talking to part of the media today after he was uh, relieved of the duties, he pretty much was saying like, yeah, I, I'm never going to like a deep dive as deep into Atlanta analytics as the game of baseball is going nowadays. And that I was never a fan of it and I tried to push it off as much as I could. Like, that's not going to fly. You you have to have the analytics at some point, you know, at, at least in your game. Because, like you mentioned, the players today are looking at analytics more than ever. The front office, they're literally in, instituting it into the game plans. Like, they want you to use the game plans for the analytics. And if you're not willing to do that, it's not you're not going to stay very long. Especially with the Angels who... Uh, you know, the, the regime now wasn't the regime that hired Joe Madden. So they're going to want to get their own guy in there anyways. And it started off the season great, but then this 12 game losing streak, you kind of just saw the, that the time or the clock was ticking. And today it finally, finally came up, but uh, you know, great, great manager at one time in the game, he'll have a story, especially helping end or helping the Cubs end that a hundred year, you know, world series drought. But you know, it's, not his time. His time's passed in baseball as a manager, in my opinion. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and jump into the National League breakdown, and we'll just go ahead and start in the National League East. Uh, we have the New York Mets leading the division at 38-19, nine games above the Atlanta Braves, who are 28-27. and The Philadelphia Phillies at 25-29, and who also recently fired their manager, Joe Girardi. Uh, the Miami Marlins in fourth at 22 and 30 and the Washington Nationals at 21 and 35, 16 and a half games back. Yeah. So um, I really think that this is, this is going to be the most crucial, you know, few weeks of this division this year. Um, you have the, the Mets are still without their two top pitchers in, in Scherzer and DeGrom, and they're playing a much tougher schedule coming up here for the next few weeks. And the team in second place, the Atlanta Braves play, probably the eat their easiest stretch of the season over the next few weeks. They get the Oakland and then they get the, I think they have the pirates in there, the Cubs in there, probably the, I think the nationals, they got a series with the nationals maybe. So, you know, this is a time where, you know, you have those, the Mets have this big lead. This is really the time the Braves could potentially make up some of that lead. Um, now uh, the Mets have a huge lead. They're playing extremely well. I mean, Eduardo Escobar hit for the cycle last night, which is pretty interesting. Um, so the Mets are doing well, and, and then you know the Braves are starting to heat up a little bit. They they've won their last you know they've won their last five games I think, um, and they you know they're they're playing Oakland for tonight tomorrow and and you know they're really starting to look a little bit better. Um, Ronald Acuna is finally getting back into a rhythm. He's actually homered three of his last four plate appearances, um, and I think that they're starting to look more like the team that we thought they would be this year. But, uh, you know, they are playing a little bit easier competition right now. So you kind of take that into, into account, too. 
Uh, but then, you know, the, those are really the two teams from this division I think are probably going to end up making the playoffs. But, uh, you know, the Phillies, there's a lot to talk about there, too, as, you know, you just had the move at manager for them, too. Yeah, and the uh, – jumping back to which I don't want to hear the Pirates being an easy team to play. We'll talk about that <laughs> here in a little bit. But, uh, it, you know, it is going to be crucial for this division right now. The Mets just came off a series with the Dodgers, uh, and they split that series. Their events in San Diego – I believe they won the first two, if I'm not mistaken. There, they, they uh, won the first game last night. I don't think they the, played game two yet. I think that's tonight. Oh, okay, because they're on a three-game win streak. Okay, so they didn't play Monday. Um, you know, Atlanta is playing the the easier competition, so they need to be able to capitalize on that. The Phillies that now they made the move. I believe it was on Thursday to let go of Joe Girardi at 22 and 29 was the record at the time of the move. I. I don't think that Joe Girardi was the problem there. Like the team is built horrible. There is zero defense on the team. I know we've talked so much about that. But there's zero defense. Uh, you are battling with your best player not being able to play the field. So you're having to play one of the guys you probably signed to be your full-time DH out in the outfield. You've given him guys like Alec Bohm, who is still trying to fig- find his seat in the major leagues offensively and defensively. D.D. Gregorius, who's been out, and then you threw up Bryson Stott, who's really struggled to start the year. Gene Segura, you know, now had a finger injury, and he's out for two or three months. You know, it, this team just altogether, the bullpen hasn't been that great. The starting rotation is questionable outside of Nola and Wheeler. Now, I mean, there is some, you know, question marks about the way Girardi managed the bullpen and some of the other moves he's made competitively, but... I just I think he was in a bad situation regardless. I don't think that this is all his fault. And I expect Joe Girardi will probably be hired to manage another team this offseason. Yeah, I mean I I agree with most of that. I do think that there that the clubhouse was souring on Joe Girardi some, which which had to do with the Phillies moving on from him. But they really Phillies just needed a scapegoat, honestly. And the the front office there is is just a very um they're not they're not a horrible horrible front office is you know I, I mean they've had some success before at different places but you know dave dombrowski is not you know you're really your modern they're, they're very you know i won't say anti-analytics but they're not they don't utilize analytics as well as a lot of teams do and um you know i think that they needed somebody i don't think i think there's a lot of unhappy people in, in philadelphia especially the the, the ownership I think it's probably unhappy, and I think they needed a scapegoat to say, "Hey, Girardi's been screwing everything up." I mean, so, I mean, I I don't know if it's I don't think Joe Girardi's a great manager, but I think at the same time, they're the Phillies needed, you know, I think at the same time that they need a lot more than just a managerial little change there for the, for them to be successful. I think they need a, for one thing, they need an entire different offensive. Uh, they did an entire different offensive uh, or defensive lineup. I mean, they they, and then their bullpen is still horrible. So, um, I don't, it's hard to manage. You know, in Joe Girardi's defense, you, you said that he the bad. You know, they didn't like the way he was managing the bullpen. How are you going to manage a bullpen well when your Corey Knebel is your only decent reliever? I mean, it's like, I just uh, I don't understand exactly what the thinking is there, but. Um, but yeah, I mean the Phillies that you know, uh, as we've said a million times, they still have the talent to win some games because they hit the ball so well, and they've been hitting the ball well lately, and they have had some recent a recent winning streak and looking a little bit better after moving on from Girardi. So you know maybe they do turn things around a little bit. But uh, but a team that needs a little bit of luck is the next team on the list here. Yeah, and that's the Miami Marlins. Um, you know, sitting at twenty two and thirty, their expected record. Uh, what was that? I was looking at it. Twenty twenty seven and twenty five. Twenty seven and twenty five. Yeah, they're they are seven and fifteen in one run games and zero and three in extra innings. This team has been incredibly un- unlucky. Um, and actually, they there's a story coming out today about Don Mattingly calling a ninety minute meeting, uh, team meeting there. And I guess really ripping into some of their players, especially Jazz Chisholm. And he's responded today by hitting two homers, one of which being a grand slam. So it will be interesting to see how that you know progresses over the next couple of weeks and whatever, because this team is good. People like with Sandy Alcantara, Pablo Lopez, Trevor Rogers, who I know Rogers has really struggled this year, but there's talent on that team that can, you know, vault them up to being close to a five hundred record and 
you know, if things really break right, maybe a possible wild card, you know, fighting for a wild card spot. But, you know, they've really just been unlucky. I can't even say they've underperformed because they've played just a lot of close games where if half of those close games flip their way, you're looking at a club that's 500 right now. Yeah, well, you know, one other thing, too, with them, sequencing has been a big problem for them. I, I was looking earlier, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I've got it completely right here, but they were – they were they have a – they've been an above-average hitting team this year, which has been their fallback the last two years. We, we always have known about the pitching, but, yeah, they have – so so this year they have a 104 WRC+, plus, which means they've hit above league average, and which is 12th best in the majors. But when it comes to runs, they are – at 22nd best in the majors so sequencing and you know just some of the stat uh, getting you know scoring with you know hitting with runners and scoring position that type of thing that's really really hurt them and i'll tell you one thing about that too is that i think part of that could be lineup construction with don mattingly we talked about earlier you know you talked about jazz chisholm maybe not being happy with him i mean he was sitting jazz chisholm a lot early in the season you know for platoon splits and it was kind of confusing as to why um, so I think that that could have a little bit to do with the Marlins underperforming and, and then, but I mean, their bullpen's not great either, that they've got some, they're not horrible in the bullpen, but they, they have some work they could do there. But, uh, this is a team that I think is going to, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. I don't think they're going to finish above 500, but they are going to be, you know, a competitive team the rest of the season. I could see them winning, you know, 75 to 80 games, uh, and getting close to 500 this year. But, um, uh, you know, moving on last team in the NL East is the Nationals. And there's just not a whole lot to say here. This team is struggling all around. Even Juan Soto has been struggling. Um, he has been absolutely atrocious defensively this year, which is surprising because he had seemed to kind of figure it out a little bit, you know, last year, you know, this year, a, a minus nine, uh, defensive value. So, I mean, that's pretty rough. Now at the plate, everyone's talked about how he's struggling. I don't really think he's been a prop, a bad at the plate. I mean, he's had he has a 2.28 average, I know, but he's got a 2.25 batting average on balls in play, which is well below his 3.18 career number. And his, you know, the projections still like him for, you know, being just an absolutely insane hitter. His walk and strikeout rates are, are still really good. They're not quite as good as they were last year, but they're still really, really good. He's gonna be fine at the plate, but um. But we'll see. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening with him. That is a little bit worrisome with his defensive value right now. Uh, but we'll see going forward. Washington in general, though, just there's just nothing there. I do think uh, Steven Strasburg's been pitching in the minor leagues, though, which is pretty good to see. Hopefully, he comes back. Strasburg is actually set to return on Thursday. Oh, cool. Um, so that yeah, that is something I saw. So he is supposed to make his major league debut or not major his season debut. Um, on Thursday after uh, rehabbing from, I believe he had surgery in the off season, if I'm not mistaken, but it, I don't really worry about Juan Soto because he's not like, if you look at his walk at his walk number, his walk rate is a little bit down, but his strikeout rates, not really that much different. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a percent higher, but it's not really all that much different from what he's ran the past two seasons. And then what he did in 2018, 2019, when it was running at 20%, like he'll be fine. I think it's, he's just kind of probably getting trying to figure out how to hit this baseball when I feel a lot of people are starting to figure that out. Maybe he's one of the slower ones on trying to, you know, trying to get the backspin on the ball or, or whatever. But, um, you know, I've never liked the fit for him in right field. I always feel like he was a much better left fielder or, or should be playing left field and right field. I feel is a harder position to play in most major league parks. Uh, and you've kind of seen that this year he's missed some fly balls that he should probably easily got to the positioning factor. He's had to run a long way and he barely misses a ball um, or clinks off the edge of his glove. Like there's little things like that, that can make the defensive value a lot worse, but he's never going to be a great defender. I just feel like he'd probably fit better if they'd move him back to left field um, where it's a lot easier uh, in my opinion, at least, but yeah. And you know, you mentioned that he's been, well negative and um in the outfield this year at minus 4.3 uzr per 150 and minus uh it's a minus one drs but his outs above average is minus six which is yeah. what they use in fan graphs calculations now 
which is minus six is pretty atrocious for outs above average. So uh, at this point in the season, especially. So we'll see what happens going forward. He, he'll probably turn that around. Defensive metrics are weird, but yeah. uh, it is definitely something to kind of look for. Um, and, and I do think also, you know, maybe he's pressing just a tiny bit, swinging, the, you know, he's making a lot more contact on pitches off the plate and, you know, maybe just not making quite as quality a contact at doing that, but he, he's probably pressing a little bit with nobody around him in that lineup. So, yeah. And that's what I was going to say. It, it, they expect Nelson Cruz to be a little bit more protection right. for him. And Cruz has really struggled to start the season, especially power wise. Um, he hasn't been hitting for as much power. I think as of late, he's kind of picked it up um, a little bit offensively from when he was doing to start the season, but why should any team really give Juan Soto any hittable pitches anymore? I yeah. mean, there's nobody else in that lineup that scares you, really. So, I mean, that could be attributing to the to the things as well. Him, him trying to press and hit, trying to hit bad pitches, but it'll be it'll be something to watch for sure. So, let's jump over to the National League Central, and we'll start with the Milwaukee Brewers, who are leading the division at 33 and 23. The Cardinals are 32 and 23, a half game back. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates are in third at 24 and 28, seven games back. Chicago Cubs at 23 and 32, nine and a half games back. And then the Cincinnati Reds at 19 and 35, 13 games back. Yeah. So uh, this has been really interesting um, division here. I I like the, I'd like what the the Brewers have, uh, but at the same time, you know, they still, that offense still scares me. And I think that um, while they've had, they've had every year, it seems like they do find some random, guys that do well offensively like this year Colton Wong's been really good offensively Rowdy Telez has kind of I won't say broken out but he's been pretty good Omar Narvaez has been um you know he's been solid as, as he usually is uh Willie Adamez has been his normal self but Luis Urias has been good Christian Yelich is actually playing pretty well right now um so that's really encouraging to see for them Christian Yelich um has a he started to heat up a little bit he's, he's up to a 95 wrc plus which is not great but it's something uh but uh their pitching's really where things are, are you know their their big their big strength is pitching and the problem is that pitching wise right now they've got injuries um i believe um you look at um i believe woodruff is out right now it's still right yes woodruff um, is out and uh peralta peralta Peralta, I knew Peralta was out. So both of those guys are out and you know, their bullpen's still really good. Um, I mean, jo- any bullpen that has Josh Hader and it's going to be good to a certain level, but they've still got some other guys who are pretty decent, but I'll tell you that the second place team in this division really is looking pretty good. And that's the Cardinals. They have a 54 run differential, which is much better than the Brewers run differential. Um, you know, the projections still do like the Brewers a little bit more, but uh, the Cardinals, uh, Paul Goldschmidt is having just, one of the best, probably, he's close to the best year of his career right now. He's been absolutely unbelievable so far this year. Uh, he's already put up three war. Um, you know, he's got he's got a 191 WRC plus. Uh, he probably won't keep that up all year, but he's gonna do really well. And Nolan Arenado has been extremely good too this year so far. Uh, you know, he's got a 134 WRC plus. He's put up 2.3 wins above replacement. Um, obviously you think about Arenado and his defensive value is going to be really good to go along with that bat. This is actually right now, if he can continue this the rest of the season, this is the best uh, WRC plus he's ever put up in his career. And that goes back to when he was at cores. So um, obviously WRC plus is adjusted to park factors, but Nolan Arenado is looking really, really good this year. Um, and so, you know, with those guys and then the best defense in baseball, and and honestly, I don't really think it's all that close, uh, defensively. I think they are just by far the best defense in baseball. Um, you know, I think really the only thing you worry about is they're starting pitching a little bit, but you know, they still had having pretty good outcomes from, uh, you know, some of their veteran guys. Like, like I think Adam Wainwright's been pretty decent this year so far. So we'll see what happens. I think, um, you know, I, I think this division comes down to those two teams for sure because the other three are just not good. But um, we'll, uh, it, it, I think this will be a really entertaining race down the stretch between those top two teams. Yeah, so the Brewers, you know, 
they've still been really good, even with uh, with missing Brandon Woodruff and Freddie Peralta. Uh, a guy like Aaron Ashby's made a big difference, a guy who's a top prospect for them. Uh, another one of those guys, they shuffle between the bullpen and the starting rotation for a little while like they do to Freddie Peralta, like they did with Corbin Burns. Um, he's looked really good since given the opportunity to start games the past couple uh, couple times through. Um, Josh Hader is insane. I believe I, I we were talking before the show, and Mariano Rivera owns the best career ERA plus at 205. Josh Hader's career ERA plus right now is 202. Like, he is absolutely insane. Still hasn't given up a run this year. We mentioned that last year. His FIP is like .99 this season. It's just an in, absolutely incredible season that Hader's having so far. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see how long he can keep this up. Because if he keeps this up for a long, like for most of the season, you'll start seeing him as like a legitimate Cy Young contender, I believe. Because I don't think any one person in the National League is really running away with it right now, um, especially with the injuries to DeGrom, to Scherzer. Um, you know, Woodruff is a guy who's usually been really good. Walker Bueller struggled. Zach Wheeler's kind of struggled. No, no starting pitchers ran away with it, so it'll be interesting to see if maybe we, you know, get a, a reliever back in that voting. Not that he'll win it, but at least in contention. Um, the St. Louis Cardinals with Paul Goldschmidt is—they are just so so good. We—they've already—they are always a sound defensive team, um, and they've even made this little run as of late, especially without Tyler O'Neill, who they've missed for three weeks. Uh, he was actually just activated today. Um, it hasn't really done anything for them this season, I believe, is because he's like 195 average and a 553 OPS so far this season. But when you have guys like the Cardinals are one of those teams that can just find a player and out of nowhere and make them great. Like this year, it's been Brendan Donovan, guy who's hitting 319 this year, 439 on base, a 157 WRC plus, doesn't slug much, only has one homer, but just a guy who is very impactful on the on the game. Tommy Edmonds been really good for them. Nolan Gorman, even since they called him up this, uh, you know, for his major league debut, he's batting 304 with a 385 on base and a 565 slugging with a, a 168 WRC plus. Like he just got the call up not that long ago. I think it was a couple weeks and he's already sixth on the offensive side in war. And that's with a negative run, uh, defensive value playing second base. Like, this team is going to be really good. The bullpen is very sound with Helsley and Gallegos. Um, Genesis Cabrera has been, or Genesis Cabrera has been pretty good. Um, so they're they're just a team that always finds a way to be that way, um, you know. And, and I think I was really critical of them letting go of Mike Schilt and hiring Ole Marmol, and he's really proven me wrong so far this year. Um, he's done a great job leading this team, so I wanted to uh, to, to say that. But the Pirates uh, mentioned I don't want to hear them being an, an easy team to play. Uh, that's because they this past week they swept the Dodgers in L.A. and they've taken five out of six against them this year. Luckily, we don't have to play them anymore. But they are a surprising team, and I don't really know what it is about them, but they just find a way to be competitive in games. And even games that they don't seem like they're competitive in, they make some run somehow and get back into competitive baseball. It's been really fun to watch the Pirates just be one of those those uh, kind of nagging teams that just never go away, really. Yeah, I mean, the Pirates have been, I mean, interesting, I guess. Um, you know, Cabrian Hayes has been a big part of them being successful so far. He's been incredible so far this year in uh, 48 games, a 1.7 war. Uh, he's put up a 289 average, 374 on base. He hasn't slugged quite yet, a, a 394 slugging percentage, but a 121 WRC plus. He's been really solid for them. Um, and, and I mean, they, you know, they've kind of thrown together a bunch of guys. I mean, it's, you know, their stats don't look very good. They've had some good sequencing in games like that. Um, I mean, I don't have too much to say about them being actually good. Um, you know, one thing that one thing that is good for them is that they've got some pretty good outcomes from pitchers that they might be able to trade or from young guys. Because Rowenzi Contreras, in his first 23 innings this year, has looked really good at, at pitching. Um, he's a top prospect, one of, one of their top guys. He, he, he just got you know called back up. And uh, Jose Quintana has actually been good for them. Uh, in his first 50 innings this year, 
Um, he's getting the ball on the ground a pretty good bit, 40, 45%, and he's got a 232 ERA and a 316 FIP this year. He looks a little bit like the guy that uh, pitched back with the White Sox a long time ago with, you know, he's not going to wow you with his strikeout walk numbers, but somehow even – even though his ground ball rate is, is, is good, but not like insanely good, he's suppressing home runs. And uh, Jose Quintana has, looked, has actually been pretty good this year so far. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I mean, this team's not going to continue to be close to good this year. I mean, they're, they're not good now. And, um, I mean, really the only thing they can hang their hat on is that so far they've been better than the Reds, although I don't think that's going to last all year. So, um but we'll see what happens. I mean, the Pirates definitely have some, definitely have a few things to look forward to, um, you know, as a club. And uh, you know, I, they've been bad, but not all that bad like we thought they might. So. Yeah. So jumping over to the fourth team in this division, we have the Chicago Cubs at twenty-three and thirty-two. Um, the Cubs started off really hot, and they've really fell back down to earth now. Uh, they have had some good performances from a guy like Keegan Thompson has been really good this year. 199 ERA, even though the FIPS at 351, uh, they, the renaissance of David Robertson, who has a 166 ERA and a, a 222 FIP this year has been really nice to see. Um, you know, Marcus Stroman's really struggled. Wade Miley has been pretty much what you expect. Um, Drew Smiley's kind of been decent, even though the peripherals don't really back it up that much. Guy who's really struggled though is Kyle Hendricks, a 5.22 ERA and a 5.44 FIP, and it's just not been a great season for Kyle Hendricks at all. Um, and offensively, they've had some some good contributions. Wilson Contreras has looked pretty good this year. Um, you know, a 2.76 average, a 4.01 on base, a 5.15 slugging. Look for him to be one of the the massive hauls at the trade deadline. Uh, you know, teams like the Astros or the Yankees who are in desperate need of a, a good hitting catcher that plays really good defense as well, they're going to pay, pay a premium for him. Um, and that's if the Cubs don't don't sign him to extension, which I don't think they will, but there's been a little bit of rumblings that maybe he might stick around with one, but uh, I don't know all too much. But Ian Happ's been pretty good this year. Nico Horner's been really good this year, a 294 average, a 324 on base, a 412 slugging. Um you know, a guy like Seiya Suzuki, he's been injured for a little bit. He slowed way down after his his start to the season. He still has a, a 114 WRC plus, which has been nice to see. But you know, overall, I don't think this is a team we expected to be like, you know, a wild card contender or a division winner. But I think they've probably played a little bit worse than I expected them to be. Although I know most people will probably say that they've been about as expected. Yeah, I mean, this team's just not all that good. I mean, um, they've been, you know, they've they've had some, a few pretty good co- contributions from guys who weren't especially expecting to be that. Uh, you look at Wilson Contreras, ha- has uh, probably having the best season of his career so far. Uh, Ian Happ's been really, really good. That's been nice for them to have. He's got a 373 on base percentage and a 14% walk rate, but he's cut his strikeout rate a lot too. That's been helpful to the Cubs. Uh, and, and you can hang your hat on the fact that Nico Horner, while his, you know, uh, he's been a le- roughly league average hitter, uh, it, that's kind of what you hope for from him because he's a good defensive player at, at, at up the middle, and he's a good base runner. And you know, you hope for him being a solid contact hitter that doesn't kill you at the plate, can hit the bottom of the lineup, and, and just be a good all around player, uh, a little bit like Tommy Edmond is from the from the Cardinals. And Nico Horner's been that guy so far this year. Uh, although he has dealt with injuries a little bit, only played 40 games. You know, that 1.2 war is really nice. And, uh, you know, 104 WRC plus for a guy who's a really good defender and a and a good base runner, it, it, you know, that'll work. Um, you know, other than that, I mean, you know, over the past few weeks, Christopher Morrell has been a really cool story after his call up. He has been playing really, really well. I don't know how long that lasts. I don't think he's going to keep up what he's doing now, but he might have kind of cemented himself as at least a, a you know an interesting player for the future. He's, he's not even a top 20 prospect for them and has been really good since coming up. And, uh, you know, one other thing to kind of point out, Seiya Suzuki really, you know, I know he's hurt right now, but he's struggled badly uh, after that really hot start. His strikeout rate went up over 30%. 
and he's got a 245 average, 344 on base, still nice, 432 slugging, just okay. I mean, he's still been an above league average hitter at 114 WRC plus, but a 341 Babbitt, and uh, you know, just down to 0.6 WAR. You know, that's not exactly what you're looking for from a guy who was as as heralded as he was coming over from from Japan. Although, you know, he, he's I guess he's still in that adjustment period a little bit. Um, he'll have to adjust back after pitchers adjusted to him. He'll have to adjust back to those pitchers, and we'll, then we'll kind of see. You know, probably too small of a sample size to determine what he is. But uh, this team's bad problem. Their, their pitching is just atrocious. I mean, I know they have have had some good outcomes from a couple relievers, but their best starting pitcher has been Justin Steele, uh, who's actually been pretty solid. But his ERA is bad. But you know, it's part of the Cubs. But uh, Marcus Stroman's been really rough. Um, a lot of that's honestly been home run bad luck for 17.4 home runs per fly ball. 17.4% uh, home run per fly ball rate is, is not, not what you like to see. And I don't think that he's going to be, um, I don't think that's going to keep up. He's, he's got a 339 X fit. So he's, he's been fine. He's, he's going to be better than a 532 ERA this year going forward. Uh, but other than that, I mean, they're just not very good in that, in that pitching department. So, uh, but this is a team that um, it's a team that you know they'll finish third. They're better than the bottom two, and they're not as good as the top two. So, absolutely. Well, we'll go to the worst team in this division. That's the Cincinnati Reds. Um, really, not much to say here. I mean, we've talked about how bad they've been. Um, you know, Tyler Molle has looked pretty decent his last couple starts. Um, started off really rough, but he's looked pretty solid lately. Uh, they've got Luis Castillo back. He's pitched pretty good. Uh, probably a little worse than he you would think he would, but been pretty solid. Uh, a guy like Alexis Diaz out of the bullpen has been a, a good find, even though he struggled with commands, walking, you know, almost five per nine. Um, brother of Edwin Diaz from the New York Mets, and their motions are eerily similar. It's it's uh when you they put an overlay over the two, and you could barely tell the difference. Uh, so I always thought that was pretty funny, but. You know, overall, not much to talk about with the Reds. I mean, Tyler Stevenson's been good. Brandon Drury's been their best offensive player, you know, per war. But, I mean, I don't know. I think the biggest storyline coming out of the Reds so far this season has been Tommy Fan slapping Jock Peterson across the face for a fantasy football league. And if that's your biggest story, you know, a 50 games, 50-something games into the season, then you'd know how bad your team is. Yeah, well, I, there, there's a couple other little things, too, with them. One, one is Hunter Green, you know, this heralded prospect coming up, and he had really struggled. He, he actually had his best start of the season yesterday, I think, through a complete game, although it was a rain-short seven-inning game, um, but had a ton of strikeouts. Only gave it one hit, no walks, looked really good. Uh, you know, that's the type of start that shows you what he can be. And so just kind of continuing his growth is, is going to be the key for them going forward. And uh, one other story for them has been how bad Joey Votto was to start the season. But he's looked a lot better. And his last 12 games, uh, or you know, over the last couple of weeks, since he came back from the IL, he's got a 197 WRC+. plus. So, uh, you know, maybe he's going to maybe, – maybe injuries were played a little bit of a factor with him to start the season. and. Uh, maybe going forward, he'll, he'll be more like Joey, Joey Votto, you know, always has been, but, um, we'll see, um, you know, this team's bad. I don't think they're quite, I think they'll actually end up being better than the pirates at the end of the day, but they're bad. So yeah, they are. Well, let's transition over to the AL West or the NL West, sorry, where we have the Los Angeles Dodgers leading the division at 35 and 19, the San Diego Padres at 33 and 22, two and a half games back. San Francisco Giants at 29 and 24, five and a half games back. Uh, and then we have a drop off to the Arizona Diamondbacks at 26 and 30, 10 games back. And the bottom of the division, the Colorado Rockies at 23 and 31, 12 games back. Yeah. So, you know, first things first, the Dodgers have been really good. Um, you know, I, as expected, Mookie Betts has really been the key to them for them so far this year, uh, as they've had some guys struggle a little bit that, typically or they would expect to not struggle uh max muncie's really struggled um you know an 82 wrc plus he has a really low babbit but his batted ball quality has been really bad too so uh obviously he's been unlucky and you know it, it, to go along with that but i don't think he'll run a very high babbit in general but uh you y'all would expect his numbers to come up a bit but there might be some lingering injury issue there are only three home runs and 168 plate appearances for him 
uh, and, and Justin Turner's just kind of showing his age a little bit. Hasn't looked very good, but um, you know, looking at the top of their lineup, I mean, Mookie Betts has been pretty much back to like that Red Sox year where he put up nine WAR or whatever it was. Like he's been insane. Great defensively, great base runner, but the offense is back. Um, 16 home runs already. Uh, 303 average, 383 on base, uh, 592 slugging. Um, I mean, he's been so good. 172 WRC plus. He's definitely in the one of the front runners for MVP in the National League right now. Uh, Freddie Freeman's been solid for them so far. Um, you know, and, and the crazy thing with that is Freddie Freeman actually leads the Dodgers in that base running metric above Trey Turner and. Mookie bet so that was kind of interesting to see but um but you look at them and the the, the pitching is is good um I, I'm a little worried about Walker Bueller um he just hasn't been the same guy this year he's not striking guys out as much his swing and miss has not been great on his fastball but they'll get Clayton Kershaw back at some point he was looking really good to start the season um and um you know I think this team will be all right I, their pitching is not as good as I was expecting it to be this year but the offense has been really good, and this team's just going to end up rolling. So, Yeah, so uh, talking about the offense here, uh, Max Muncy's on rehab assignment. He uh, should be back within the next week or so. Uh, he went on the IL for lingering some of that lingering elbow issue you were talking about. Um, Justin Turner, although he started terribly bad, um, the past month he's – been pretty good a 263 average but an 827 ops and the last couple weeks he's been a 273 average with a 782 ops um so he's starting to heat up that's usually what he does he struggles to begin with um it but it's really been a story about the top three in that lineup mookie Betts, freddie freeman trey turner um those have been the guys carrying the offense chris taylor at times has had big hits the 33 percent strikeout rates you know, kind of worrying, but I usually expect it to, to come down. I think it's small sample size that it will even out eventually. Um, you know, Bellinger, the stats don't seem to say that he's been playing that well, but that bats have been quality. I think that's what I'm, I'm more looking at with him. Like he consistently takes deep at bats. Um, and now he just needs to figure out how to quit fouling the pitches off and to make good contact with them. Uh, and overall the pitching staff, I think it's actually been, pretty good for what they've gone through. Like Tony Gonsolin has a 159 ERA and leads the national league in ERA. Although the FIP is a 304, but still a 304 FIP isn't bad at all. Tyler Anderson has been really good. A 259 ERA and a 312 FIP. He has a like 26 or 27 inning scoreless streak going right now as well. Kershaw uh, should actually return on Sunday. He just had a rehab outing uh, this last Sunday went really well. Um, and the plan is for him to be activated this weekend and for either Saturday or Sunday um, against the Giants. You know, Andrew Heaney, he's also rehabbing. He'll sh- he should be back in a couple weeks. Uh, but Walker Bueller, what you've mentioned, the, the weird thing about Bueller this year is you can't really pinpoint what one thing has gone wrong for him. It's It changes from different starts. One time it's the fastball velocity. Then it's the fastball command. And then the next start it's the changeup command. And then it's the slider command. And then it's slider velocity, and it's just been weird. Like one thing he fixes, and it messes with a different thing. So I expect him to to you know you expect a guy like Walker Buehler to figure it out. I wouldn't be too awfully surprised if sometime in the next you know going into the All Star break or something, they do one of those like phantom IL things with him and give him just a, a week or two to try and figure it out. Especially if you're getting a guy like Kershaw and a guy like uh, Heaney back, who you want to be in the rotation. And I don't really see them going to a six-man rotation, and you can't really take Tyler Anderson or Gonsolin out of the rotation the way they've been pitching right now. Um, and Urias has been about what what you expect. The bullpen has really struggled since losing Blake Trinan. Um, you know, they've had to have Craig Kimbrell's not been the best, but they've using Mitch White. You know, has gone from the bullpen to the starting rotation hasn't been that great. Bruce Dar's really struggled this year, um, and guys like. You know, Yancy Almontes and David Price is who they brought in to, or not David, not this year, but Yancy Almonte is a guy they brought in who was a cast off from Colorado and had to be some meaningful innings and like eighth inning guy um, this year. So they really need to get a, like Trinan back um, and they need to find 
figure out what's wrong with Kimbrel. Um, he's looked pretty decent his last couple outings since they went through some mechanic stuff. But, you know, I, we expect the Dodgers to be the Dodgers, and I think they've shown that this year so far. But the big thing, I think, is the Padres are only two and a half games back, and they're doing this with the starting rotation that has had question marks, um, you know, missed time from Clevenger even, and no Fernando Tatis Jr. So when he gets back, he's going to be a tremendous boost to that team. And if they can get that starting rotation back in line in September, these two teams play like 11 games or nine games against each other or something like that in the month of September alone. So if they are able to keep it even remotely close with not having Fernando Tatis Jr. in that lineup, it's going to be a really interesting ending with this to the season. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the pitching. They've dealt with some injuries, but they've been really good. And they have a bunch of depth this year, different from years past. And a lot of that comes back to the fact that Mackenzie Gore is breaking out for them. Uh, in his first 48 big league innings, he has a 222 FIP and a 150 ERA. This is a guy who had been on prospect radars. He was a high draft pick. Everyone thought he was going to be, you know, the guy out of that draft. And then his prospects honestly faded a little bit because of just some mechanical issues he went through, had, a, had some health issues. And uh, last year, you know, his command was gone and they were – but but he's back this year, and he looks extremely good in the big leagues. And that's to go along with Joe Musgrove, who has been incredible so far. Uh, Sean Manai has been really solid for them, really having the best year of his career, honestly. Um, and then you look at uh, Hugh Darvish has been solid. And um, Mike Clevenger's looked good uh, since he came back. So, um, you know, Blake Snell's been their worst pitcher. And while he has a 568 ERA, a lot of that due to walks. Um, you know, his expected numbers are a lot better. 393 FIP. I mean, you take that from a, the sixth best guy in your rotation right now. So uh, the really the only thing I really worry about with them is the bullpen. Uh, they don't have a good bullpen. Tim Hill struggled this year. Um, you know, they struggle with walks. Uh, really, their only guy is Taylor Rogers, who is really good. But um, Luis Garcia has been pretty good for them, actually, too. But they, uh, they definitely need some help in that bullpen, but that's something that they should be able to find some bullpen help at some point here going forward. So uh, definitely uh, definitely an interesting team. Um, the Bats, Manny Machado playing like MVP Manny Machado has been really good for them. He's one of the front runners right now in the NL. Uh, you know, and they've had like Jerks and Profar has been really solid. Uh, and, and, you know, they hope to get uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. back at some point. So uh, definitely a team that's being carried by pitching right now, pretty surprisingly. But, you know, eventually they're going to get, you know, one of the best players in, in baseball back. And uh, there's no way that some of these guys that they've got hit really poor, playing really poorly right now. Like, uh, you know, Jake Cronenworth is, is hitting poorly. He's got a 87 WRC plus. He's a lot better than that. Um, you know, you look at some other Trent Grisham's a lot better than, a uh, 75 WRC plus. He's a better player than that. So they've got some guys who are struggling who are going to get going at some point. And, and with the addition of Tatis, hopefully, you know, in July or so, uh, this is a team that could really start to hit their stride, you know, down the stretch of the season and, and a team that's really not that far behind right now. So definitely look for the Padres to be up there through the rest of the season. Yeah, I expect the Padres to – you know, I've always expected them to to be in contention with it. Um, and we made a, you know, I don't see that late season collapse coming this year. We saw last year. We mentioned it a lot with hiring Bob Melvin. He's always a guy who will make a team play better than they probably are. And a guy who, even without names in that bullpen, I expect him to, you know, do pretty well. I mean, even a guy like Nabil Krismat has been really good for them this year, um, you know, as being a bullpen arm, one of the best best guys they have and they'll make moves at the deadline to to improve that area but you know like i said they're going to play a lot against la late in the season so if that series if that you know division race is anywhere close it's going to be you know some intense games later in the season but uh you know looking at the third team the division the san francisco giants and i think we've we're seeing what we expected we've seen them kind of have the regression from what they were going to what how they performed last year. I don't think any of us thought they were as good as last year. Thought We thought they were a good team, but we just didn't think they were the best team in baseball. And they're playing about how you'd expect. They're, what, five, six games over 500 right now. Um, you know, a positive 30 run differential. This is a team that's going to be in contention for a wild card spot. Um, 
you know, they've been pretty good pitching wise offensively. Mike Yastrzemski's looked like the guy he was a couple years ago. Um, Jock Peterson, who really struggled to start the season, has picked it up as of late as well. Brandon Crawford's really struggled. Um, but you've had some good performances from a guy like Luis Gonzalez, you know, 124 uh, plate appearances, 321 average, a 363 on base, a 446 slugging for a 129 WRC plus. Um, Evan Longoria has been pretty good since he's come back, you know, a 124 WRC plus, even though the strikeout rates at like 32%, but pitching, I mean, Carlos Rodon has been really good. Logan Webb's been not as good as he was last year, but he's still a top of the rotation pitcher. Alex Cobb has, you know, the ERA is at a 573, but the FIP is at 263 and he's throwing harder than he's ever thrown before. Um, this is just a team that finds pitching and does a really good job at making them, you know, using the analytics to pitch better than they have in other places and utilizing what they do best and beating the competition with that. Yeah. So, so a couple things with this team that in some ways are good and some ways are bad. Um, one thing to look at with the, with the giants is that they have the seventh worst ERA in the majors right now out of all teams. But on the flip side, they have out of pitchers, they have the 10th best war because their FIP is 3.48 compared to a 430 ERA, uh, which typically would show some bad luck, but diving a little bit deeper, they actually are, I believe, the second worst defensive team in the big leagues right now and not behind the Phillies. The Phillies are, are in the bottom three. And I think, you know, going forward, based on their reputation, the Phillies are going to be, uh, you know, close to there. But the, the Giants have actually been the worst defensive team in the big league so far. Um, so that, that goes along with the seventh best offense. So one thing that's something that's really hurting the, the Giants is that they can't their pitchers are really good. But, you know, if the ball ever gets put in play, they're not getting out. It's kind of like the Phillies problem. I mean, you got like uh, Evan Long or uh, Luis Gonzalez has been horrible defensively. Evan Longoria is not good defensively anymore in his 22 games. Wil Wilmer Flores can't play defense. Jock Peterson's not a good defensive player. Uh, and, and that's not to say that these guys have been bad. I mean, Jock Peterson at the plate has been insane. 44 games he's got a 163 wrc plus uh mike kastrzemski's been really good at the plate you know uh, 142 wrc plus but you know defensively uh, a minus 1.1 defensive value he's still been a really solid player for them this year but um they really need some help um you know they, they really need some help on the on the defensive side tommy la stella in 14 games negative 2.7 defensive value i mean that is hard to do almost uh, Brandon Belt's been poor defensively at first uh, in his 26 games. Lamont Wade's been bad defensively. Darren Ruff's been an, atro you know, an atrocity in the field. So there's been a lot of issues with these guys defensively, and um, they got to figure that out because they've got way too good a pitching for them to be this bad defensively. And uh, I mean, like the way, like I say, they've hit the ball pretty well. So you know, you kind of hope that they would, you know, with the way they've hit the ball. And that was kind of the question mark coming in. Are they going to hit well again? Because we felt like the pitching would be pretty good. And I mean, it's just been, it's one of those things where if they can figure out that defensive, the, the defense, they will probably be able to stay in the, in the wild card race as, as probably like that third wild card team. But uh, we'll see what happens with them. But moving on, uh, two more teams to go. Uh, the Diamondbacks are one of them. And it's not all bad for the Diamondbacks so far this year. No, they've had some really good performances from a guy like Zach Gallen, a 240 ERA. Uh, Merrill Kelly's been pretty good so far. A guy like Joe Mansupply, as they found out of the bullpen, was pretty bad last year. A .43 ERA and a 157 FIP this year. Uh, Kyle Nelson's been pretty good for them as well. Madison Bumgardner's not been horrific. Zach Davies has kind of been what you've expected. Uh, they've had some good offensive performances. Cattell Marte, 107 WRC+. Plus. The average is probably a little low for what you would expect. Joe, Josh Rojas, 276 average, 356 on base, 114 WRC plus has been really good. Uh, Dalton Varsho has been pretty decent at a 109 WRC plus, but they're, they're not a great team, but they're a team that can be, you know, play teams tough and, you know, take some games that maybe you expect they shouldn't take. But overall, I mean, not much of a competitive game baseball here but they have a couple guys that are uh, future pieces in zach gallon like josh rojas and Cattell Marte. yeah just 
kind of expanding on them a um, couple things number one for the for, for the diamondbacks they have some bats that are really looking pretty good right now um but their babip is atrocious as a team it's it's really crazy how bad how low their babip is as a team um you know a couple guys to kind of look out for christian walker has really got he's got great discipline numbers so far he's hit 14 home runs and 215 plate appearances. He's got a 110 WRC plus, but his BABIP is a 185. If he can bring that up to even like a 250, which is kind of on the low end of what you would consider sustainable, uh, you know, his bad, his average would be around a 250, probably be at like a 130, 135 WRC plus. And he's actually been positive defensively in the, as a first baseman, which is which is hard to do. Uh, so that, that's a nice thing. David Peralta is another guy. He's been really solid for them this year. 110 WRC plus on the season. Uh, kind of all around offense, defense. He's a guy that can maybe move at the deadline. They weren't really expecting to be that guy. Uh, you know, Cattell Marte started the season, dealt with a little bit of a, I think he was dealing with a little bit of injury early, like the first week or two. Um, and then he's, he started to heat up a little bit lately. Uh, but you kind of expect him to eventually get going. Um, and uh, this team is, I mean, I, it's, it's, Alec Thomas has, hasn't gotten his numbers up yet, really, but he's kind of looked the part at the big league level. And then, like you mentioned, the pitching uh, with that, that rotation, Zach Gallon's looked pretty good. He's actually looked really good. Merrill Kelly's been pretty pretty decent. Um, you know, kind of the other guys, you're kind of getting what you're looking at. I mean, you're getting a typical Zach Davies season. He's not striking a lot of guys out, but he's getting some weak contact, and he's going to have a between a four and a four and a half ERA. That's kind of who he is, like – um, you know, we'll see what ends up happening with, with their pitching. Um, there's not really all that much to say on their pitching. It's just not, it's, it's, it's just not that good. They just don't have a lot of guys. Uh, Madison Bumgarner, ERA is good, but the, the, the peripherals are not good at all with him. So, um, you know, he's, that contract is looking really, really, really bad. So, uh, and we kind of expected that to start with, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Diamondbacks, definitely a team that, you know, you're kind of looking at – they're in full-fledged rebuild mode. So you're just kind of looking for guys who are going to – who are going to just, uh, you know, hopefully get a little bit better um, as the season goes on and looking for some of those young guys to develop. So Yeah, and then looking at the last team in this division, the Colorado Rockies at 23-31, and 31, I think a lot of us expected them to be at least better than the Diamondbacks. Um and I think a lot of that just really has to go to this pitching staff has been really, really bad. I mean, the one real bright spot has been Chad Cool, who has a 317 ERA, and even his FIPS 393. Uh, Kyle Freeland's had some good starts, but Antonio Sensatella has been really bad. Austin Gomber's been bad. Herman Marquez has been one of the worst pitchers in baseball. Um, and just overall, I mean, I know it's hard to pitch in Coors, but this pitching staff uh, has just been really bad. Offensively, they've had... You know, good performances from C.J. Crone. Uh, Connor Joe was really good to start with. He's kind of come down a little bit back to earth. Um, Jonathan Dawes has been pretty decent. Brendan Rodgers, he started off really, really bad. But his past month has a 337 average with a 942 OPS and five homers with 17 RBIs and 20 runs. Like, he has been really good. The, the, per, like, the player we all expected him to be um, and showed flashes of it last year. Uh, he's been that for most of the season this year, and the numbers still haven't even really evened out. A 266 average, a 316 on base for only a 95 WRC plus still. Like, that's how bad he was to begin the season. That over his last month, he's been almost a 340 hitter, and, you know, he's still an uh, under league average hitter, supposedly per WRC plus. Um, you've had good performances from a guy like Jose Inglesias, 314 average, 363 on base, a 102 WRC plus playing really good defense like you expect um you know overall not much offensively but you had some good performances ryan mcmahon you probably expect to be uh a lot better than what he has been you saw a breakout last year and this year he's back to a 91 wrc plus so uh, if you can get ryan mcmahon to get back offensively and then this pitching staff to maybe progress some I mean, and i don't know if there's a median that they can jump back to but you need guys like antonio Senzatella and herman marquez to really turn it around yeah, this is a team that I think I think their pitching is a lot better than they get credit for. Um, they have, uh, you know, I talked about how San Francisco had the worst defense so far in the big leagues. Colorado is second, and when you're in Coors Field, you cannot give up outs that you could possibly get. 
their defense has been horrific. Um, you look at CJ Crone is just not a good defender at all. He should be, they got a bunch of DHs, honestly. I mean, Connor Joe's a poor defender. Um, you know, you look at, uh, uh, Brendan Rogers has been really bad defensively. Charlie Blackman should not be playing the outfield at all. Um, you know, this is a team that, you know, uh, Randall Gritchick should not be playing. Their outfield defense is just unbelievably bad. And, and in cores with such a big outfield, you just can't have that. Um, you know, you look at their their fit. Their ERA is really bad as a team. But, I mean, a lot of that comes back to just the fact their defense is not getting the balls that they should be getting to. Uh, you know, you go back and kind of look at their, um, you know, you kind of look at their, their team, um, their team FIP. And it's really hadn't been all that bad. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's just. It's one of those things. I, I mean, this is a team that just, um, I don't know. They, they, there's, it's hard. It's hard for a team to do well in cores. I mean, they're, they're you know, they're fifth, they're 20, they're 19th in pitching war. I mean, it's not good, but um, it, they, they just, I don't know. I mean, they're, they haven't had Herman Marquez much this year. Um, he's not pitched well. I, I mean, he's got a 388 X FIP. I mean, but you know, it, it's tough. You you hope for a guys in this in that ballpark to have somewhere around a four to four and a half FIP. It's kind of like a three and a half to four ERA anywhere else. And these guys, they, they're not getting it right now. So, but hey, Chad Cool's been pretty good, so that's interesting. Yeah, and and just one little note to wrap up on the Rockies, and then we'll jump to players of the week. As a team this year, and especially playing in Coors, their WRC plus is ninety three. That is the, uh, I think it's the fifth or sixth worst in major leagues right now. And for overall war offensively, they're, they're third to last. I mean, I know that does take some of the defensive numbers in, but still as a team who you're playing in Coors Field, your WRC plus to be 93 as a team, that's not going to cut it at all. Yep. Um, especially if you're not playing good defense. Uh, especially, yeah. but and, and and one other thing, I wish I could say things were looking up, but their farm system's really not all that good, and they just signed Chris Bryant to a giant contract, and he hasn't really even played this year. He hadn't, he still hadn't hit a home run this year. He's been de- dealing with injuries, and which has been a problem for him in the past. I mean, this this this, this it's going to be tough for a long time in, in in Colorado, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. So, well, let's jump over to our players of the week. So, who do you have for your offensive player this week? So, my offensive player this week is Alejandro Kirk. And uh, we haven't talked about much AL because we were doing our NL breakdown. But the uh, the Blue Jays have really started to come along this week. In fact, there were three Blue Jays in the top five in war this week. Um, so, which is pretty in- incredible. Uh, Alejandro Kirk led the big leagues in war. Um he had a 300 WRC plus in his six games this week, hit four home runs, a 391 average, 481 on base, and a 957 slugging percentage this week for him. And uh, he did a lot of this playing catcher, as uh, he'll probably have to do a little bit more catching going forward with Danny Jansen going on the IL. But uh, he's been um, he's been solid for them. Um, you know, you could also pick Santiago Espinal, who um, he's been really good too. I mean. This team, uh, this team is really starting to click, and and that's with uh, you know your typical guys that you would think of like Guerrero Jr., Bichette, those types of guys not being up in this top five. I mean, they've had good weeks, but they haven't quite done what you know Alejandro Kirk and and Espinal and Teoscar Hernandez have done this week. So uh, definitely starting to look, things starting to look up a little bit for the uh, for the Blue Jays right now. Yeah, what Alejandro Kirk did. I watched some of the Blue Jays games this weekend, um, and. It was pretty impressive to watch what the some of the at bats he was putting on, um, you know. And then you mentioned a guy like Santiago Espinal. He's a guy who basically came into the year as a starting second baseman, really struggled to start the season, um, and then over the past week they recalled Kevin Biggio, and as soon as they did that, it seems like it lit the fire under Espinal again. Who, as soon as they did that, goes off for a 400 average, a 464 on base, and a 269 WRC plus this week. So. I guess the Blue Jays know the secret. Just uh, if you want your second baseman to do play better, just call up the guy who might replace him, and then he does a lot better. So it has been a you know really good week for Toronto offensively, as you mentioned. Alejandro Kirk was leading that charge. Uh, for my player this week, for offensive player, I went with Kyle Tucker. Uh, we could have went with Jordan Alvarez. I think he was in consideration for both of us, uh, but since we had talked about him a little bit before with the extension, um, 
Uh, we decided to go with his teammate and Kyle Tucker, who had an amazing week as well. 421 on base or 421 average, 522 on base, 789 slugging, a 278 WRC plus this week. Um, exact, you know, strikeout and walk percentage this week. This week, Kyle Tucker has turned into an absolute star. I think we saw that breakout last year. Um, and the batting average is a little down this year, but I think everything else is kind of really following it up. And uh, he's going to be a nightmare for years to come um, and be one of the best hitters. And people, I don't think he, he gets enough credit for what he does, and, and people will start recognizing that. It, but uh, good week from Kyle Tucker offensively and uh, and the Astros and the Blue Jays. I guess those were uh, the two options we had for players, offensive players this week at least. Yeah, for sure. Uh, going over to the pitching side, um, I decided I, would, I decided to go with Adam Wainwright. Um, he pitched two games, 14 innings. Uh, he did give up, uh, I believe, two runs in those 14 innings. Uh, but he just did Adam Wainwright things. I mean, um, pitched on Sunday night baseball through to Yadier Molina twice, um, which they just continue to increase their record number of times that they've, pit, that they've been the battery together. Uh, and he has just been putting up solid numbers. Um, like I say, 14 innings, 129 ERA, just two earned runs in his two starts, with one of those being Sunday Night Baseball uh, at age 40, and he's got a 273 ERA on the season. So um, <laughs> he's uh, he's been really, really good this year. It's, it's kind of hard to believe how good he's been. Uh, but, um, you know, one, one other interesting note in that game, that he pitched in on Sunday Night Baseball. The Cardinals pitched. Uh, so they, they had it went to extra innings, went 11 innings, and the Cardinals had two pitchers throw. And I don't remember too many times that's happened in recent years where you pit, had two guys pitch 11 innings. So that was kind of interesting. But, um, but, yeah, Adam Wainwright's been really solid this year. Yeah, are we sh- even sure that Adam Wainwright's going to retire at the end of the year if he keeps pitching this like point, this? At this point, I don't know. I mean, he's been really good. <laughs> he's been so good. Uh, one of those guys who is aging like fine wine for sure. Uh, for my pitcher this week, I went with Michael Walker. Uh, had a start against the Cincinnati Reds, went five and two thirds, three hits, three strikeouts. Uh, but the really the game was last night, actually the final nail in the coffin for Joe Madden. That was against the Angels. He threw a three hit shutout with a six strikeouts and one walk. So. The week Michael Walker had, he's been really good this season. Um, you know, I think a lot of us laughed it off, thought it was maybe just a depth signing, um, you know, maybe minor league guy or swing man out of the bullpen. This year he has a 199 ERA and a 376 FIP. Like this is the Michael Walker we saw for most of his time in St. Louis. Um, so he's been really good. And if if he can be a guy to keep that up, if they get Chris Sale back, um, you know, if Nathan Uvalde keeps being it, it's going to be a good find for – you know, for Boston. Yeah, Michael Walker has been pretty solid this year. And uh, honestly, he's kind of fallen into that type of guy. He's kind of a number four starter uh, in a rotation. Right, right now, he's two ERA. He's not going to keep that up. But, uh, you know, since 2020, um, his ex has been around four every year. Last year with the Rays, he actually had a uh, 391 x fit which is pretty solid. Uh, he had a five ERA. I, I think his expected numbers are a little bit better than his ERA has been for a while now. Uh, but this year may be a little bit of, a, you know, kind of the baseball gods evening that out a little bit. But uh, I'd like to see him strike out a few more guys. He's only striking out 5.9 per nine innings. But, uh, you know, he, he's doing a pretty good job for them. And, and as a back end of the rotation guy, he has been more than just a little depth piece swingman type. He, he's really been a, a solid piece for them in their rotation. So, um, hopefully he keeps that going. The Red Sox are playing pretty well right now, so uh, maybe they can hang around. Absolutely. Well, that's pretty much going to wrap it up. Unless you have anything else you want to you want to button up on? Um, not too much. I, I just wanted to plug the um, the, the NCAA baseball tournament, uh, college baseball. It's been really crazy this weekend. Um, just tons of insane games, great moments. Uh, been watching a lot of it. Uh, there were several double-digit run comebacks in the, you know, in winter go home games, and um, you know, I think it's been a really, really, really entertaining thing to watch over the last uh, three or four days. So this coming up weekend will be the super regionals. So uh, that's definitely something I would encourage anybody listening to us to, to tune into and uh, 
to give it to give a look at because it's been really really fun to watch. Yeah, it's been uh, there's been some crazy games in there for sure. Um, some big comebacks, some high scoring games. Um, so I'll definitely be tuning in this weekend. So uh, be fun to watch for sure. But that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Batflip Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week. Thanks, everybody.